Yeah. I'm just so confused as how to get out of here. Okay, well, let me mute you for a second here. Can you hear me that whole time? That's awkward. I don't know. <laughs> Let, What's going on, here we go. Mute everybody. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Everybody should be muted except me. I'm hoping. And let me see if my okay. My poll is working now. Now, uh, I'm trying to open my chat here. Can everybody hear me now? Can you hear me? Let me know by the chat. Okay, I'm hearing or I'm seeing that people can hear me. That is fantastic. Okay, so it looks like we have Janet, Kelly, Christine, Michael, and Veronica. Um, and I'm listed as the host. Okay, um, that is that is great. We have a small group tonight. Um, mostly, I'm thinking from my Tuesday Thursday class because you guys have the exam tomorrow. However, um, there might be some people from uh, my Monday Wednesday. Uh, let me see with the chat. Is anybody here for my Monday, Wednesday? Uh, Kelly, okay. Um, welcome. Um, I am recording this, and uh, you should be able to see. Can it? Can it, anybody see on their screen that it is uh, recording? I just want to confirm that. For my, okay. Thank you, Michael. Okay, good, good. Okay, and you know, with that in mind, we want to be careful what we might say, not say, or whatever, um, just to uh, keep in mind that things are, are being recorded. So, what I'm going to do, let me just uh, move this out of the way, and I'm going to try to, here we go, oops. Uh, from the beginning, if I can, here we go. Okay. Uh, so you should be able to see that the, well, I have a uh, PowerPoint up on the, up on the screen. And, uh, if you, I think most of you were probably participating last time as well, but, uh, I'm going to show some questions and then give you a chance to, register an answer that's going to be anonymous and uh, then we'll kind of reveal the uh, what everybody saw and uh, kind of go from there now uh, just for the people who are reviewing this as a recording um, the poll will not show up on your screen all you'll be able to see is the uh, the questions themselves so don't uh, be concerned if you can't see the poll. I will try to read it off to help you see how people answered. Um, like I said, we have a small group here of about uh, five or six of us, I guess. But um, that's fine with me. I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. And I will keep an eye on the, uh, on the chat area in order to answer questions. If you have a question or if you want more explanation about something, just uh, feel free to kind of type that in. So uh, without further ado, let me, you sh should have a poll showing on your, uh, on your screen right now. And let me see if I can give us our first question there. Yeah. And so, Freud called the actual pictures or images in dreams the what kind of content? So go ahead and use the poll to 
answer that as a question. So is, uh, oops, I'm sorry. I forgot to launch the poll there. There we go. Now you should be able to uh, register. So the actual pictures that uh, are part of our dreams. This is from chapter five on sleep and things like that. Um, looks like uh, two out of four people have put in a response so far. Uh, oh, looks like everybody has put in a response now. So I'll end the poll and uh, share the results with you. And as you can see, uh, Three of you went for the latent content. That's the actual, uh, uh, what you thought was the actual pictures. And two of you went for number two. Certainly number three, number four, if you had your BS detector on, uh, you know that that's not the correct answer. And let me show you what the correct answer is. And according to, yeah, the world, uh, the Actual pictures are the manifest content. Uh, the hidden meaning, though, that was what the latent content, number one, uh, that's the hidden meanings that you had to go to Freud in order to get him to sort of interpret the, uh, the dream that you had. So uh, the best answer for this was... Uh, uh, the manifest content. Uh, taking a, an example from another area of life, uh, when you load a truck, you fill out a loading manifest. It lists what's in the truck. And uh, so the actual pictures or the actual contents of the truck, that's the manifest content. Okay. Um, like I said, use the chat if there's a... Uh, uh, a question that you want to uh, ask regarding anything, uh, any of the questions here. Okay, uh, we launched the poll. Here we go. And I'm giving you a new poll there. And let's move to another question. Uh, Moesha was always tired. Yeah, she would fall into bed around 10.30 every evening and be asleep in seconds, but woke up frequently through the night. She's most likely suffering from what? What's the best diagnosis for what she's suffering? Wakes up frequently during the night. Um, what's she most likely suffering from would you say night terror sleep apnea narcolepsy or insomnia so one of these um is probably more correct than any of the others and it looks like uh we have all five out of five have cast a vote so i'm gonna in the poll, and uh, one of you went for the first one, night terrors, and two of you went for sleep apnea and insomnia. And the correct answer, whoops, yeah, I did share the results with you, I hope. Uh, yeah, now you can see how everybody answered there. Um, the correct answer here, would be actually insomnia. Uh, night terrors, it doesn't say that she wakes up with a nightmare, uh, you know, panting, uh, sweating, maybe with a scream. That would be a night terror. Sleep apnea is where you stop breathing. That's a possible answer in some ways, but it doesn't really say that she stopped breathing. Uh, so insomnia, inability to fall asleep, she doesn't have what we call primary insomnia, but she has secondary insomnia where she's just uh, having a hard time staying asleep. And uh, I think I may have mentioned that that's really the most common sleep disorder that we really do encounter. 
is, uh, is insomnia. Narcolepsy is somebody who falls directly into sleep, and that certainly wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be accurate here. Um, I mean, if three o'clock in the afternoon, if you fall directly into sleep, that we would probably say is, is uh, narcolepsy. So uh, a little bit of a question on sleep disorders that I covered in, in class here. So, okay, let me uh, clear the poll and let's try another question here. Oops. Okay, drug addiction or drug dependence. That's what we're looking at here. When does that occur? So I'll kind of let you uh, read over that question. And pick what you think is the best alternative. Does it happen? Drug addiction or dependence occur when an individual lies about taking a drug? Uh, drug no longer causes a person to get high, but they take it again. Biological or psychological dependence on taking the drug develops, or a person can be without the drug no longer than five days. Which is the best? Looks like, uh, oh, four out of five of you, of you have put in a vote so far. And now we're up to five out of five have put in a uh, put in a vote. So I'm going to end the poll and let you see. I'll share the results with you. And as you can see, most of you chose number three. Drug addiction occurs when biological or psychological dependence on taking the drug occurs or develops. And yeah, that's the, uh, that's the correct answer. I think one person may have chosen number four. If you can be without the drug no longer than five days, boy, uh, you're, you're, you've gone a while without being with without having the drug that's that's the person who has an addiction can't be without the drug probably for a day um, now do people lie about taking drugs who have drug addictions yeah but the best answer i think is number three um in fact let's let's look at uh uh number two here a drug no longer causes a person to get high. Anybody remember what that was called? Or you need more in order to take, or uh, you need more of the drug in order to get high. Anybody remember what, what I called that in class? I think I was referring to a person who could really handle their liquor. Use the chat area if you, uh, if you know the answer to what I'm asking there. If the drug no longer causes the person uh, to get higher. They have to take more in order to get high. Anybody trying to see what? Uh... Yeah, tolerance. Yeah, thank you. It was probably up there. I, uh, for some reason, it wasn't showing up on my screen. Yeah, thank you, uh, Veronica. Uh, yeah, if a person develops tolerance, it takes more of uh, whatever their uh, substance of abuse is uh, uh, it, it no longer does the trick. They need uh, three beers instead of one beer in order to uh, get drunk or uh, uh, more heroin or, or whatever. And, and that's not a good situation to be in, to tell you the truth. Okay, let me... Reset the poll here. And give you another question to take a look at. See if this is still from chapter five. No, nope, we're up to chapter six here, uh, talking about uh, learning. And uh, yikes. Push the wrong button. In one of Pavlov's studies, he trained a dog to salivate in response to a buzzer by repeatedly sounding a buzzer before placing food in the dog's mouth, meaning 
he made the buzzer go off and then gave food and, uh, to the dog. The buzzer became a what, and the salivation to the sound of the buzzer became a what? What's the best answer here? Condition response, condition stimulus, condition stimulus, condition response, condition stimulus, unconditioned response, or unconditioned response, unconditioned stimulus. What's the best answer here for this question? You are definitely going to need to know what these uh, what these things are. This conditioned response, uh, conditioned stimulus. You definitely want to know that. Remember, we did the worksheet on this. Um, the kid with the rooster and uh, Kathleen's car accident, and uh, I think Billy who got spanked by his daddy. So. Looks like four out of five of you have put in something. Now we're up to five out of five. And I'm going to end the poll and let you see that you all voted for number two. And let's check the board. I feel like Steve Harvey again. Survey says, yeah, the buzzer becomes a conditioned stimulus for a conditioned response. Um, the buzzer initially was neutral. Oops, I think I may have given away an answer here because um, I have a couple more questions about this. But the buzzer was neutral, but it, by pairing it with the food, it becomes a conditioned stimulus for a conditioned response of salivation. And I think I said that the um, conditioned response may not be as, as strong as the unconditioned response, but they're going to be very similar. The dog uh, uh, may have drooled 10 drops to the food, but only six to the buzzer. But uh, it's pretty much the same type of uh, uh, of a response. So, okay, uh, good job. Uh, I'm proud of you for all getting that one correct. Okay, let me give you a clean slate here to start voting again. And let me give you another question here, again from chapter number six. A researcher decides to classically condition a rabbit by presenting a sound each time before delivering a puff of air to the rabbit's eye. He finds that the rabbit starts to blink upon hearing the sound. What function does the air puff have? What is the air puff? Of these five things here, is it a conditioned stimulus, unconditioned stimulus, conditioned response, unconditioned response, or a neutral stimulus? What's the best answer here? The air puff. We're looking at the air puff. And here's where I get my BS detector out. The air puff is definitely not a response. So you can pretty much eliminate number three and number four. The air puff's not a response. So the researchers making a sound right before that air puff in the eye. Okay, looks like we have uh, five out of five voted. So I'm going to end the poll and share the results with you. And as you can see, most people voted for the second one, that the air puff is an unconditioned stimulus. And that is, in fact, the correct answer. Um, the, uh, the air puff is a unconditioned stimulus uh, for an unconditioned response, probably, of uh, uh, blinking. And I think I, I mentioned in class 
many of us have had that uh, test where they put that puff of air in your eye and uh, we tend to jump back when we experience that. So the correct answer is that the air puff is an unconditioned stimulus. It's natural to uh, blink or jump back. Uh, we don't have to learn it. So that means it's unconditioned or natural. Conditioned means that we had to learn it. Um, and that, that would be, uh, uh, that wouldn't describe what the, what the uh, air puff is. Okay, still keeping an eye on the chat area down here just to make sure uh, nobody has any special kinds of questions. So let me relaunch the poll. And you should be able to get ready for a new question. Here we go. Okay, this is the best question of the night. If you understand this question, you are in great shape. If you get this question correctly, I see a question in the uh, chat area and I'll get to it in a few minutes. But uh, this question is a terrific question for the evening. So, positive reinforcers blank a response through the presentation of a positive stimulus. Negative reinforcers do what to a response through the removal of a aversive or bad stimulus. What is the best answer of the night? I see two of you have voted so far. So I'm waiting for a few up. Oh, we're up to four people have voted. Four out of five. Oh, we're up to five out of five. Everybody has voted at this point. So let me end the poll and share the results. And you should be able to see that four out of five of you voted for number one. And notice, let me clear myself out here. We're talking about reinforcers. And I'm a terrible teacher. I don't think I mentioned reinforcement at all in class. And I hope you're laughing to yourself when I say that. But a reinforcer, whether it's a positive or a negative reinforcer, in fact, let me show you the answer. It strengthens or increases a response, whether it's a positive reinforcer or a negative reinforcer. Positive reinforcers strengthen the response because you give something good later. My dog is about uh, five feet away from me, and when she sits, I sometimes give her a treat as a positive reinforcer to strengthen her response. But remember, if you're listening to Justin Bieber, and you want to get rid of them by raising your hand, um, a negative reinforcer also strengthens a response, raising your hand, because it takes away Justin Bieber. Uh, so somebody actually chose number three there. Uh, remember, when we see this word reinforcer, this one right here, oops. We see this word reinforcer right there, and where is it? Uh, reinforcer right there. We're always talking about something that strengthens a, uh, a response. Uh, in fact, if a response decreases, what happened? Let's, uh, let's do that. Use the chat area. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Yeah, punishment happened if we've decreased a response. Um, yeah, punishment. Thank you, Christine. Um, so 
keep in mind if a if something any behavior if it increased reinforcement happened if it decreased punishment happened sometimes and in fact your book mentioned something called extinction um, if we stop rewarding a behavior you know you do it uh, my dog sits and nothing happens my dog sits nothing happens my dog sits eventually my dog may stop sitting uh, that we call extinction. It's kind of similar to punishment in some way because we're not we're not really rewarding the, the poor little doggy anymore. But if a behavior generally, if it increased reinforcement happened, if it decreased punishment happened. Now I want to go to uh, Veronica's question here. What's the difference between an unconditioned stimulus and a neutral stimulus? A neutral stimulus is something that we don't react to at all. Um, remember on the worksheet, the intersection of Woodward and I forget what the other avenue was, Congress Avenue, something like that. An intersection is neutral. It's just uh, no reaction to it. But once you have an accident there, it's no longer neutral and it becomes a conditioned stimulus. An unconditioned stimulus is something that does bring out a reaction. So a neutral stimulus, there's no reaction at first to. An unconditioned stimulus, there is a, a, a reaction to. Um, that's unlearned, it's, it, it's unconditioned or natural, I think I called it, in class. Let me... Uh, Try to clean up my board here a little bit. And I hope that was helpful. Um, in fact, going back to uh, anybody remember uh, Little Albert and the, uh, the white rat? What was the, um, what was the neutral thing with little Albert and the white rat. What was the neutral stimulus at the beginning of that whole video clip? Anybody remember? Yeah, Michael's on it. Boy, you got fast fingers and fast thinking tonight. Yeah, the rat was neutral. You know, uh, Albert even reached for it and wanted to play with it and pet it and stuff like that. It was neutral, no reaction. But then they paired the rat with that bang loudly behind his head and the rat no longer was neutral it became a conditioned stimulus so maybe that's that's a way of thinking about this the neutral thing like uh, the buzzer or the bell or uh, Pavlov's keys it's neutral at first but then he it becomes a conditioned stimulus because we pair it with uh, an unconditioned stimulus a couple of times. So I hope that I hope that helps uh, uh, make sense at first. Billy's daddy, he's an unconditioned stimulus at first, but once he starts spanking Billy, he's become a conditioned stimulus, and Billy starts crying whenever he sees a guy. Okay, let me. Relaunch the poll here and see if I can give us a new, here we go, give us a new, oops, I think I went the wrong direction. Here we go. Okay. Which of the following is false? Four of them are true. One of them's false. Which one is the false one? Got one person on the board so far. Four of them are true. One of them is false. And we're up to four out of five people have put in a response. I'll wait a couple more seconds here. 
And it looks unanimous. And I'll share the results with you. But as you can see, everybody said number five is false. Punishment is not the best method for getting children to behave. And I go back to that example we used in class of Billy, whose father's punishing him all the time. And uh, um, it just is not a good method. Kids who get punished can become very aggressive. Um, kids who get punished, especially, you know, spanking, physical punishments, they may believe that hitting is, uh, is acceptable. And uh, I used to have a saying when I worked with parents, I would say, catch them being good. You know, if you catch them being good, you don't have to worry about them being bad. Um, you know, if, if Joey and, uh, uh, Joey and Tommy want to fight with each other all the time, what you do is say, Hey, if you guys play together for 10 minutes, you're going to get it, uh, play together nicely for 10 minutes. You're going to get a treat and you use positive reinforcement or you just praise them and love the heck out of them for doing the good things, then you don't have to worry about the bad things. So uh, yeah, punishment is not, in fact, punishment may cause the person, as we see here, it may cause the person to avoid their punisher, it may create fear and anxiety, may increase aggression, and it may encourage be behaviors like lying to avoid the punishment. So why on earth would we use it on occasion for something uh, we, we may use it. Uh, that's where I advocate time out and stuff like that. But uh, it is not the best method for getting children to behave. Okay. Let me... Somewhere I hid my poll. Here we go. Uh, so let's get ready for another question here. And... Oh, yeah. Punishment. That, that is false. Okay, here's one about schedules of reinforcement. I think somebody asked me, uh, would we uh, have any practice questions about schedules of reinforcement? On average, a child will receive $10 from her parents around every two weeks for cleaning her room. What type of reinforcement schedule or pattern are the parents using? It's a variable ratio. Fixed interval, variable interval, fixed ratio, or continuous reinforcement. What's the best answer here? Yeah, it looks like two out of five of you have put in uh, put in an answer. Up to three out of five. Remember, you're allowed to bring a three by five card, three by five inch card with handwritten notes, and uh, uh, probably want to put something about schedules of reinforcement up there. Five out of five of you have answered. And so I'm going to end the poll, and you're going to laugh when you see the results. <laughs> I don't know how this happened. One of you got it correct, and four of you got it incorrect. So let me show you what the correct answer is. Number three, variable interval. Okay, so why is it an interval, first of all? And it's an interval because we're talking about a passage of time. So you really had a choice between uh, fixed interval and variable interval because we're talking on average every two weeks, around every two weeks. Now, if we said uh, every two weeks on a Friday, that's a fixed interval. That would be number two. But we're saying on average, uh, around every two weeks, kid gets... Uh, $10 from her parents for cleaning a room. 
and uh, that would be an example of a variable interval. Now, how about if I said every third time the kid cleans their room, they get 10 bucks? Use the chat, and if I said every third time, what is that an example of? And yeah, uh, in fact, to be definite, Michael, yes, it is definitely a fixed ratio. Every, exactly, every third time. And uh, I would bet if every third time the kid gets uh, um, $10, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they're going to they're gonna clean their room so that on Wednesday they get a... Uh, uh, $10. What's going to happen Thursday, Friday, and Saturday? I'll bet they're going to clean their room again so that on Saturday they're going to get their reward again. Um, the uh, fixed ratio, uh, you know, leads to a lot of, or, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, fixed ratio or, uh, yeah, that's a fixed ratio every third time. They're, they're going to uh, respond a heck of a lot. Okay, so that would be, yeah, okay. Let me, let me relaunch the poll, clean off the, uh, the answers here, because I think I have another question using those schedules of reinforcement. Let's see. Oh, no, actually I have, um, why are, in fact, I'll, I'll explain this. Why are ra variable ratios or intervals so resistant to extinction? Well, I think I explained in class that um, you never know when the payoff's coming. On a fixed schedule, you know when the payoff's coming. And so you maybe, you know, five minutes before the boss shows up or, uh, it, you know, you, you know exactly when it's coming and you don't necessarily... Uh, uh, respond at a high rate, but boy, those variable ratios, especially slot machines, um, stuff like that, really lead to deep learning that is resistant to what I call extinction, where, you know, we could even stop rewarding you and you'll keep on, uh, um, keep on responding. Um, I, I mentioned Mystery Tipper program. Maybe every once in a while, if you're a waitress, I'll tell you, we're going to send somebody in to the restaurant who, if you really give good service, they're, you're going to get $100. But you never know when that person's coming. That would be a variable kind of schedule. If we said every Friday we send them in, Monday through Thursday, people are going to get lousy service. And... Uh, on Friday, everybody's going to be on their toes, the wait staff. But if we make it a variable ratio or a variable interval, you just never really know. And you're going to give good service all the time in that kind of situation. So uh, those, those variable schedules are, are pretty, uh, pretty powerful uh, in terms of helping learning happen. Okay. What do you think about this? Uh, is this learning? An infant stops sucking its thumb. What do you think? Is that learning? Hey, it looks like a couple of you have put in a, an answer so far. This is not on the test, by the way, but maybe it, it talks about learning a, a, a little bit. Uh, looks like four out of five put in a response. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you the answers here. And uh, three of you, whoops, three of you said no, it's not learning. And I would tend to agree. Maybe it's maturing or getting bored or something like that. Now, let's say the parent puts pepper on their thumb and the infant stops suck, sucking its thumb. I might call that learning because they've learned, ooh, my, tongue, my 
it, it burns when I uh, uh, suck my thumb. And uh, that might be a relatively permanent change in uh, uh, behavior based on experience then. But if they just plain old stop sucking their thumb, it may not necessarily be learning. It might be maturation. Okay. Let's see. I think I have another just sort of fun one here. Ah. After working on a difficult puzzle for hours, Jane finally figures it out. From that point on, she can solve all similar pro puzzles in the time it takes her to read them. Is that learning? Somebody was click, quick on the button there, a couple of you already. And it looks like everybody voted, so I'm going to end the poll. Let you see that most of you said, yeah, that's learning. And I would tend to, whoops, I would tend to agree. That is definitely learning. In fact, that might be that insight. Uh, aha, now I know how to do these. And from then on, boy, she's, she's a whiz at it. And I would definitely call that, uh, I would definitely call that some learning. Okay. Let's give you a brand new poll. And I think we're moving to chapter seven here. Talk about memory. Which of the following is true about the process of encoding? If you remember, there were three processes of learning. Encoding. Does it hold information in memory for some time? Does it involve accessing information in memory for use? Does it involve changing information from one form to another in order to get it into a particular part of memory? Or it's limited to only converting visual information to signals for the brain to use. What's the best answer here? Yeah, it looks like two out of five of you put in a, in a response. Oh, we're up to four out of five now. So let me end the poll and let's see that. Uh, let's see, two out of four of you went for number three. And that is, in fact, the correct answer. Number four is incorrect because it says it's limited to only use it converting visual information, but don't we convert stuff we hear into signals for the brain to use? That's encoding. Uh, stuff we feel, that's encoding. So uh, the best answer would be number three there. Okay. Let me give you a Another question. I think I have another one from chapter chapter seven here. Remember, uh, the majority of the questions are probably from chapters five and six, but there will be questions from this chapter that we're looking at here with memory and also the chapter eight on cognition. So, oh, this temporary storage system holds seven or so items of information for about 20 seconds. Which memory, in fact, we're talking memory structures here, I guess. Which structure of memory are we talking that holds information for about 20 seconds? Yeah, it looks like all of you have put in an answer so far. Oh, no. Oh, that's kind of strange. Okay. Um, looks like everybody put in a vote so far. So let me end the poll and let you see. Most of you voted for short-term memory. And that is, in fact, the correct answer. S sensory memory lasts about zero to four seconds. These are out of order, by the way, uh, short-term and long-term memory. 
stuff goes from sensory memory down to short-term memory and then to long-term memory. Iconic memory is sort of like a, oh, flashbulb memory. It doesn't last very long at all. I wouldn't even say 20 seconds. Um, and it's, it's uh, not the correct answer that I was looking for especially seven or so items. That's maybe a tip off as to what the correct answer was for that one. Okay, let me relaunch the poll here and see if I have another chapter seven question. Ooh, remembering how to ride a bicycle even though you have not ridden one for years is an example of what type of memory? Declarative, procedural, semantic, or episodic memory? I think this is a pretty easy one. It looks like three out of five of you. Ah, everybody put in an answer so far. So I'm going to uh, end the poll and let you see the results. And three out of five of you said procedural memory is the correct answer. And that is in fact the correct answer. Declarative is uh, um, what facts and figures. Episodic is uh, remembering your last birthday party. That's episodic. Semantic, I'm not real interested in. And procedural, yeah, that's how to do something. So those are those sort of different types of memories that I, uh, I think I covered in class there. Okay. So here we go with a clean poll for you. And ah, uh, you ask your little ne nephew to recite the alphabet he just learned in school. He can only remember A, B, C, and X, Y, Z which is explained or consistent with what? Collaborative rehearsal, maintenance rehearsal, the serial position effect, semantic confusion. What's the best answer here? Yeah, we got uh, four out of five have put in a, uh, an answer. I think this one was pretty easy. I did give it to you in your notes. Um, and, uh, if you have your BS detector on, semantic confusion is just something I made up. So that's definitely out. And let me end the poll, let you see that all four, four out of four of you went for the serial position effect, which is incorrect. I'm, it, is, it is the correct answer. Uh, kind of misspoke there. So, and uh, ABC is an example. I, I think I mentioned the primacy effect. The first things that you see in the list, uh, that, that's the primacy effect that he can remember it. And the recency effect, X, Y, Z, they're the last letters of the alphabet. And they kind of stick in his head pretty well too. So, okay. Uh, let's grab another question here. So now we're into chapter eight, talking about cognitions. Which of the following is most likely to be a prototype for the concept of furniture? Category is furniture, Alex Trebek would say. What's most likely to be a prototype for that, for that concept or category, furniture? Furniture 400, <laughs> what's the most likely example of a, uh, a, a prototype for the category of furniture, concept of furniture? And we're kind of scattered on this one, kind of interesting. So let me end the poll, share the results. Uh, three of you went for chair. And that is in fact, the correct answer. Remember, a prototype is the most representative or most commonly thought of maybe example 
of a category or a concept. And, uh, you know, throne, pew, or settee, those are rare kinds of stuff. I grew up Catholic, so pew, uh, I, I still uh, would pick chair as a, uh, a prototype for a uh, type of furniture. Okay. So, let's see if I have anything else here. Ah, which are more accurate? This is a fun one. First impressions or in-depth analysis? Uh, somebody just put number three in there, which... Uh, <laughs> There isn't a number three, so which is more accurate? First impressions or in-depth analysis? And everybody voted. So let me show you the poll. Uh, we still have somebody who picked number three. So, but those of you who uh, uh, picked the first or second one, uh, First impressions are lasting impressions, but they're often very ina uh, inaccurate. And an in-depth analysis is usually a better estimate of uh, uh, what's going on, or it's a more accurate appraisal of what's going on. Okay, let me uh, give you a fresh poll here. Oh, actually, I don't even need a fresh poll. Um, what other questions do you guys have since you got me here? I'm looking at the chat area to see um, what other kinds of questions. Uh, I've mentioned that chapters five and six, you really want to know well. Um, chapter seven and eight, there's about eight questions from each one of those chapters, and the bulk of the questions are ch chapters five and six. So I'm looking, do we need to know negative and positive punishment? No, but you do need to know that if a behavior decreased, if a be behavior decreased, what happened? Let me see that chat area. If the behavior went down or weakened or decreased, what happened? Thank you, Michael, yeah. And if it went the other direction, if it increased, uh, reinforcement happened. So let's see, Kelly, unrelated to the test, but how many extra credit assignments can you do and how many points are they worth? You can do a total of three extra credits uh, and each one raises your final average by one percentage point. So if you have an 89 average and do one extra credit, your final average would be a 90. You increase it by one point with the extra credit and uh, you would have an A. If you didn't do the extra credit, you got the B. <clears throat> so what other questions can I, uh, can I answer here since you got me? What can I help you out with? How important are the different stages of sleep? I wouldn't say very uh, important. I didn't uh, emphasize them a whole lot. I said that there's, uh, what, four different stages of sleep plus REM sleep. Um, and I, I kind of gave you a few uh, uh, descriptions of what goes on during REM. You know, that's sort of our restorative uh, sleep and we're, we're kind of uh, unable to move during uh, um, REM sleep. I think I talked about with Tommy Wazinski, who unfortunately was able to move and walked out his third floor window. But for the most part, we're not able to move during REM sleep. It's important we know about meditation, hypnosis. Mm, I didn't really emphasize it a whole lot. I think everything you already know about it would be sufficient if there is a question about meditation and hypnosis. So I, I wouldn't uh, sweat meditation and hypnosis, to tell you the truth. What else? What else do you, do you think you uh, might wanna ask me now that you got 
me here. What's my dog's name? Nobody asked me that. Sophie, she's munching on a bone here. Is this test just like the last one? 50 questions, multiple choice. Exactly, Michael, like the last one. Actually, 51 multiple choice questions, you could actually get 102% on the, uh, on the exam. What kind of dog is Sophie? Sophie's a border collie. Yeah, she's, uh, she's a pain in the you know what. Oh, jeez. All I have to do is mention her name. Suddenly I had a dog's head in my lap. Um, it's funny because she was a pain in the butt at first, but uh, she's kind of grown on me, I have to admit. Had her about six, seven years now. And I'm positively reinforcing her for sticking her head in my lap by petting the heck out of her, which she loves. She also loves belly rubs. What else can I help you with? Well, seeing, seeing no other comments. Oh, thanks for the review. You are welcome. I will do this for our next two exams as well, final and our third, our third and final exam. And again, I hope this has been uh, helpful for you. Uh, should you be familiar with specific drugs? I would say, in general, you want to be familiar with drugs uh, sort of in general, maybe what they do and stuff like that. I would bet you know the answers to any questions about drugs even before you took my course. Uh, some of you may have taken a lab course in drugs and experimented a little bit, so you may have a leg up from every on everyone, but I wouldn't uh, suggest you uh, go experiment with some of those things. But I, I think drugs uh, you probably know a lot about already. So I didn't cover it a whole lot in class. You're welcome, Janet, by the way. Uh, anybody else have a, have a question? Uh, you are welcome, de nada, for those of you who speak Spanish. And uh, I, uh, I kind of like doing this, so I'm going to keep on doing it. Uh, I will send the recording out to Tuesday, Thursday classes, uh, probably in about an hour and a half, two hours. But uh, I need to convert it to the right format and uh, whatever. So anyway, have a great night. Uh, thank you for uh, participating. And uh, I'll see you at the exam.